Uh, let's dive in. There's a lot of material to cover today. Um, I just want to to say that we, we are back from a uh, civil rights trip that the synagogue just took. Uh, and in this room, uh, Debbie and David uh, were on that trip. Um, so this, I need to apologize to you that, that this will all be stuff that we've pretty much covered on the trip. <laughs> but through a midrashic lens, um, and please chime in with your with your experiences as well as I'm going through it. But I thought it would be interesting to sort of give you the trip, highlights of, from the trip through the lens of midrash and through Torah. Um, cool. And I want you to keep in mind that that question from the beginning about what the voice of our ancestors may be calling out to us in this moment, um, because that will come up. But we, we had this um, terrific tour guide who brought us through Atlanta, Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham. And he actually framed the trip in a, in a surprising way. The first thing he did is he led us through a bracha. He's, he's Jewish. And it was Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shekacha Lo Beolamo, which is Blessed are you, Lord God, Creator of the Universe, who placed something as beautiful as this in your world. So that's the that's the first text. Was well, this just you guys on the trip, or was it combined with other people? Just Bnei Asher, and it was thirty-two people. Uh, it was it was fantastic. Um, so the first text. Uh, who wants to read the Me'iri commentary on Brachot 58b, which is where that blessing actually comes from? Any takers? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. And we'll translate. Great, so that's straight from the Talmud, and it says, one who saw a beautiful beautiful creatures or beautiful trees recites, blessed are you who put something such as this in your world. Uh, I just want to say hello to Rabbi Josh. He was the one who organized the trip for us. It was an amazing trip and we're teaching about it now. Thank you for everything. And, and your mom was on the trip and we had a great time with her. It's fantastic. Uh, okay, so that's that's the prayer. Now, do you want to read the commentary, Ruth? And may you read on that blessing? You can do it in Hebrew if you like. He continues. So that's just a repetition. That's the same thing, but now he's going to comment on it. The one who sees beautiful trees, beautiful creatures, says that blessing. He continues. Hmm. How would you translate that without reading my translation? How would you translate that? He's saying, and it, it, it appears to me that even in a place where they're, hi, Sarah, well, great to see you, Sarah. Well, thank you, thank you for joining us. <laughs> so all you missed is that we just came back from a civil rights trip, and this is sort of the Torah of that trip distilled into a, an hour session. <laughs> so welcome, and I hope you have a sheet. If not, there are more here. And make yourself a plate. Um, it seems to me he's saying that, especially in a place where there are no beautiful trees or beautiful creatures, mm -hmm. that we can find a little something new there too. Is that how you would translate it? How would you translate his part? What he's what? What is the What is the new thing that you might Right. What is the, the, the new thing you might find even in a place devoid of beautiful trees and beautiful creatures? So what occurred to me when our tour guide was, his name is Scott Freed, was uh, beginning our tour of the South, of some of the depths of human cruelty uh, and horror, starting with a prayer that you say when you recite beautiful things, was finally made clear to me when I uncovered the Me'iri's commentary on it, which is even in a place, especially Dafka, in a place devoid of these beautiful things, you strive to find the little something new there, and I will translate that little something new there to be examples of human goodness that break through the horror of the evil. For instance, I'll just say one, one story about the Shoah because we're, we can't help as Jews but, but resonate with our own experience of horror and oppression. And of course, so the, the Shoah, the Holocaust is gonna permeate through all this as well as our experience as Jews in America and our own um, experience of lynching that's the Leo Frank story and so on. But, but um, 
there's a story from the, the Holocaust, you may have heard it, that um, somebody was sick in the barracks and um, was gonna die, right? Already malnourished, uh, uh, just totally decimated physically and uh, was gonna die. And in the middle of the night, um, everybody who had saved some of their rations, right? A ration of their crumb of bread. And they all gave that little ration of their own ration to this sick individual. And in the, you have to imagine this dark barrack at night and he whispers, thank you. Mm -hmm. And they respond, no, thank you. You've reminded us what it means to be human. So, so how could you recite a shakakaloba olamo in the depths of the darkness of human cruelty and horror when there are moments like that? Davka, when there are no beautiful trees or beautiful people, there might be a ktsat chidush, something, something new still to be found there that is the grateful, the thing for which we are grateful that God placed in God's world. Go ahead. Uh, we were told an arboretum a few days ago. Gorgeous, yeah. And a place that have thousands of plants. It's apparently one of the, 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 the biggest arboretums in the country. And while there nothing was in bloom, there was still a beauty to what was there. The mm -hmm. barren trees and so forth. And also mm -hmm. the promise to come. Mm -hmm. The promise of in a few months in spring, mm -hmm. they will again be blooming. I, I think that's beautiful, right? But sometimes the mere suggestion, even if it's not there yet, there's the pointing towards hope that they're right. It's not here yet, but but don't lose faith. The trees will come back. The, the flowers will, will spring forth and again. Also in front of the Neyushua, there's some, I mean, what trees they are. Mm -hmm. The trees that have those beautiful red leaves yeah. remind me of the same thing. And those leaves will be shed, but they will return the following beautiful. year along with the greenery. Love it. Thank you. It's a great reminder. Yeah. Last time he will visit right? down the south. The interior. Last time when he will visit was what? Down south. And he went to the Marquesh and other areas. There's no trees from Bile. No trees, there's no shrub, nothing. Mm. It's a gorgeous area. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's mm. the perception. Ah. It's in it, 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 you. You want to go to that kind of landscape before. Mm. You don't need it. Great, right? So sometimes beauty isn't just the typical flowers and trees. There's something beautiful about a barren wasteland too, right? There's something harrowing and silent and, and beautiful about that too. Um, let's do Sherry and then Nelson. Um, this morning, kind of off left side, slowly, but every bare branch of the little trees is covered with snow. Can't hear. She was saying every bare branch was covered with snow, even in this first snowy winter day of the season. Uh, the branches uh, uh, being full of snow, covered in snow, is something beautiful to that. Is that right, Sherry? Did I? Yeah. Uh, let's go, uh, Nelson, uh, uh, David, Bill, and then I do want to move on because we have so many texts to get through. Um, I wanted to say that without faith, hope is cruel. I, I like what Elliot said. If you have, you can have hope is wonderful if you have faith that it will be fulfilled. But otherwise, it's just cruel. It's, it's just empty. Mm. It just doesn't do anything for you. So it's really a test of your faith. Mm. Without faith, hope is cruel. Is that what you said? Yes. That's beautiful. Thank you, David. So I don't know if you're probably eventually going here anyway, but I'm going to go here. So when we were in Selma, it's very run down. It's really, really, uh, I mean, there are empty storefronts, broken buildings. Uh, and the people we spoke to in Selma, uh, Joanne Brand and uh, her older sister, uh, Linda Lowry, experienced being put in jail just for protesting for voting rights when they were children. And they protested because their parents couldn't afford to lose their jobs. So they sent out the children. Uh, white or black? Black. Uh, and, you know, the town had a population of 34,000 or so, about half of which was white. Now it's got a population of 17,000 and it's almost all black. Uh, so that's another negative results. So you could say, isn't this also terribly negative? And they told us about how one had been in prison 
or I should say jail, uh, nine times and the other one 13 18. times. Um, and they were marching daily, not just the march we've all heard of, but marching around town daily. Uh, and you could say, wow, this is as bleak as bleak can get. And and where are you now in this in this really impoverished town? That, but they were both such sweet women, e even Joanne, who's very gruff on the exterior, uh, who are still working to improve their town and improve their situation. And so, right. That's a shahalo alama. Right. Sometimes it's the, the subtext may be horrible, but the text is within our power to write. Right. It's like the Yom Kippur liturgy of each deed is assigned with our name. Right. In the book of life, you still ultimately decide what to do with the text, what text you get to write, regardless or maybe in spite of a, a very difficult context or, or subtext. Um, Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was uh, struck with the words, uh, especially uh, mm. Steve Smith, especially in a yeah. place. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm reading it almost backwards, and that is, if I want to find something new for myself or, or to do something, I have to put myself out of my comfort zone. I have to move away from the beauty mm. that I'm accustomed to uh, so that I can find that something new or do that something new, and which is kind of what your trip was all about. Seeing that uh, people right. move themselves have that conversation, but even on a personal level, level you must do that. Yeah, absolutely, I, and that's great, and, and making me think uh, why the Torah was given Bamidbar in the wilderness, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you have to get away, some someplace barren. Think about the wilderness is that it's half care, it's ownerless, right? Something away from that in order to to be able to tap into revelation to receive Torah. Um, mm -hmm. This midrash. Um, is one of my absolute favorites ever, and we've studied it once in this class before, but uh, I'm playing favorites and bringing it back. So does anybody want to uh, read? Go for it, Larry, thanks. And Abraham wrote early in the morning, signed his donkey. The Shimon Yochai said, life sets the natural order, you have a mic. Can you please use the mic? Oh. Love upsets the natural order and hate upsets the natural order. Love upsets the natural order. And Abraham rose early in the morning. Surely he had plenty of slaves. But the reason was that love upset the natural order. Okay, folks, pause. Point being there, Abraham rose up early. This is what episode? What's happening? Yeah. Just yeah, okay, finding Isaac, he wakes up early to do it uh, because of his devotion to God, and he saddles his donkey himself. He prepares everything he needs. And the rabbis are asking, why did he do that uh, manual labor himself? He was wealthy. He had servants. He had slaves, right? Why not have them do it, is the question the rabbis are asking. And their answer is, love disrupts the natural order. Natural order here not meaning slavery as a natural order, right? That was one of the horrible excuses for slavery that that people came up with. But the natural order of things being that, why would you do the work yourself if you don't have to, right? But he does opt into doing that work himself because love is the great motivator. Love disrupts what would otherwise be the natural course of things. Okay, and then go ahead. We're gonna explore the flip side of that now. Hate upsets the natural order and Bilam rose up in the morning and saddled his donkey. Surely he had plenty of sleep. Hate, however, upsets the natural order. First, the Israelites in the wilderness by Balak, uh, uh, the, the king of Moab, and um, he saddles his donkey himself. Again, he would have had plenty of slaves to do it for him, but motivated by hate, he can't wait to do it himself, right? So same idea, but the flip side. Love and hate are these powerful forces, powerful enough to disrupt what would be the natural order of things. Okay, keep going. Love upsets the natural order, and Yosef made ready his chariot, etc. Yet surely Yosef had plenty of slaves, but love upsets the natural order. Context there is why he's getting his chariot ready. 
to go see he his father. Dead. To go reunite with his father for the first time. Yaakov, who thought he was dead all these years. So that's an example, of course, of love. Keep going. Yet surely it... Um, oh, hate obsessed the natural order. That's the natural order. And he made ready his chariot. This one is Pharaoh. Pharaoh. And why is he making ready his chariot? He's exactly. named after the slaves. Bring the slaves back. Reinstitute slavery of the Jews in Egypt. Keep going. Yet surely he had plenty of slaves. He had fewer, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> this hate upsets the natural order, whereby Shimon Boyhai said, let, let saddling counter interact saddling. Let preparing counteract preparing. I think this is so beautiful, and this is the, the midrash of it. The, the, how it's working, you probably noticed, that it's taking verses that are similar and putting them in conversation with one another. That is what Midrash is. That is textbook Midrash. But it's taking counterexamples, one of love disrupting the natural or one of hate, but through the same example, right? And he prepared his chariot or he saddled his donkey. You have love doing that in the case of uh, Joseph and in the case of Abraham, and you have hate doing that in the case of Pharaoh and in the case of Bilam. Both are disrupting what would be the natural order of things. And then the conclusion the rabbis say is, let saddling counteract saddling. Let preparing counteract preparing. It's not that we can ever erase the harm that's done, right? It's not that anything you can do can ever undo the wrong that is done, but we can try to counteract the harm that was done by doing it for good, for love. Right, that same action that was used for bad, we can we can transform it into an action of love, and in some metaphysical way, try to counteract. Again, not undo, but respond in a in a in a in a loving and and productive way. The destructive, hateful way that it was done before. Does that make sense? Or we I could, love that it's. Or, like, or we could, uh, uh, George into plowshares. Right. Exactly. Good. <laughs> People want to do things, one thing, and try it out. In other words, um, yeah, you have simply, you have all kinds of helpers, but you want to, want to know what's involved. In some cases, for negative, you want to find out why your slaves aren't doing it properly. Sure. Is it is a, a satisfaction and a nastiness, as you say, it's good and bad. Because you want to do you want to do it yourself for a positive thing, say, oh, hey, you know? Yes. You can do. Um, no, it could be out of curiosity, but I think here it really is about this being motivated by love or hate, that it is driving you to do it when you wouldn't otherwise do it. Um, but that is a is a great point. But again, it to me it all fits into this conversation about in the midst of this horror, there is hope because you can you can give your rations to to a sick neighbor in the barracks of the Holocaust and be reminded of what it means to be human, even in the depths of, of utter inhumanity. Right? That that there is these 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 flashes <laughs> of good and hope that that come out of the most unthinkable horror. Exactly right. That's why it's Israel's national anthem. Yeah. So the eternal cynic here, and I'm sorry, I know this is your favorite movie, but I disagree with the premise that uh, love and hate are outside the natural order. Um, or, I mean, I use the analogy of uh, water is a liquid. Uh, you do something to it, uh, you add energy to it, it becomes a gas. Mm -hmm. We don't think of seam as unusual or outside the natural order. It's just mm -hmm. a different way of, of water existing. Similarly, you freeze it, uh, we get ice. Right. We don't see it as outside the natural order. It's part of the natural order. Mm -hmm. So how can we look at humankind and not think that love and heat are part of that's part of nature? Mm -hmm. And that maybe most of the days we're walking around not at those extremes, but there are times we have those extremes. Yeah. And so I was surprised that that's the premise. Um, I don't know what to make of that, yeah. but I'm just surprised that yeah, I mean, I know it's trying to be illustrative of the point. Yeah, maybe taking the extremes, but it doesn't resonate. That's fair, and and hold on to the water imagery because that's going to come back. 
the one pushback I'll I would my water. Yeah. <laughs> the one pushback I would make is that I don't know that it, the text is claiming that love and hate are outside of the natural order. It's just saying that it that it disrupts Upset. the natural. It may still be within the natural order, but these are forces strong enough to disrupt. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So if one assumes that the natural order of things in a society where you might hold slaves is that they do this work for you. Yeah. One could also interpret the verse, all these verses, as, of course, the slaves do the work for you, but they're nine entities. They're just right. your slaves. So we don't, when we say you prepared your chariot, of course they prepared it, mm -hmm. but that's you preparing it through them. Yeah. On the other hand, if we think about Maybe another thing that underlies this, um, I'm thinking that Selah Melokim in a sense here, um, this assumes the opposite. This assumes that since your servants, your slaves are just as much people as you are, we would explicitly say they, they prepared it if you hadn't prepared it yourself. So that in and of itself is kind of revolutionary in a world where probably that wouldn't have been the case. It certainly wasn't the case where we just came from yeah. prior to emancipation. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. One point, then Jerry, and then I want to move on. But one quick thought that you're bringing up here is what is the natural order and who determines what the natural order is? And how do we challenge our assumptions of what is the natural order, right? <laughs> In, in, in a way, I would say that slavery is a, a, a gross aberration of what should be the natural order of B'Tselem Elohim, right? Certainly in our text, that is the natural order. God creates us all in the image of God. You could push back with saying, well, there's also a condoning of, of certain indentured servitude or, or slavery, depending on how you read it. But I would say that was our, I think, God accommodating to what we did to disrupt the original national uh, natural order, which is that we're all created, we're created equal. Um, but so hate in that way, I would say, disrupted God's natural order of things. And then MLK and in, in, in this nonviolence movement was love disrupting the natural order, right? Was saying, we are going to fight this hatred and violence with, with, Un uh, miraculous love and understanding of the people who are doing this to us, trying to take that approach of what is what is what has created this hatred? What what have you been taught? How have you and what are the systems in place that have but doing that from a nonviolent, loving uh, uh, place, which was so revolutionary. And ultimately, you could debate whether it was effective enough. But um, go ahead, Jerry, Ron. Uh, and, and then we'll, yes, one more, and then we'll continue. There are a couple of things. And then, I mean, and then Nelson, too, has his hand, yeah, yeah. Unless I'm mistaken, none of us have been slave owners. Um, <clears throat> but when you read about slavery, um, there's a whole mindset uh, in slave owners that we have difficulty uh, tapping into. But uh, they did use their slaves, not only as not an entity, but yeah. not a being. We never hear the name of a slave. Um, maybe the um, the women we hear, but we never hear the name of a man slave unless I'm mistaken. Um, and uh, I don't think slave owners uh, did things because they wanted to see what it was like. Yeah. I don't think it was part of that mindset either. Thank you. Uh, Ron? Okay. What I was going to say is that the, what we think of today is we can't hear you. What we think of today as being the natural order can change. I mean, take, I mean I'm mean, i thinking about climate change and how we, we take for granted all these big storms now. It's, now it's part of the natural order. So it changes. Yeah. yeah, as a species, we're incredibly adaptable, right? We adapt to things that disrupt the natural order becomes the new natural order, right? It's not necessarily consistent forever. Right. I, I was thinking at a different level. This suggests that every action can have a reaction. Mm -hmm. That if you were looking at it mathematically, it's mm -hmm. like a zero sum game. Yeah. And that zero sum game is going back to the natural order because you've disrupted it in one direction, you've disrupted it mm -hmm. in an equally prevailing degree to, in the other direction, <clears throat> and you end up where you started. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. No, it's. I, I think it's. it's 
It's a, a brilliant thought, and uh, it's making me think of, and I've quoted this once before, and I quoted it, misquoted it the first time, I'm going to misquote it again. But Emerson talks about the truest course, or, uh, uh, speaking about human nature, but how do you know what a human being really is? So the truest course of a ship is a zigzag line of a thousand tacks or something like that. Point being, when you, as a ship, you, you catch the wind in your sail, which pushes you in one, and then you go in the next row, and you, you create a zigzag line. And ultimately, what's in the middle is the path you're, that you're ultimately committed to, is that straight line path. But in, it, bringing up the science and the mathematics of it, I always saw that image as like a helix, a double helix of a DNA. That's sort of, the, the strip, like human nature is in the middle there. It's not, it's not our worst and it's not our best. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, and, but I think that, that's such a helpful image because when you're in the, in, in the darkness, when you're in the worst of us, it's very hard to, to um, access the best of us or, or remember that we're, if you look at the course of human nature and our history, we're probably somewhere in the middle there. Um, okay, there's, uh, let's keep going. Let's keep, oh, Nelson, and then let's keep going. Can't hear you. Yeah. Why don't we just keep going? Uh, I'll, I'll interrupt later. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so David brought up uh, a woman we spoke to, uh, Miss Linda Blackman Lowry. She turned 15 during the uh, 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery. She was the youngest of the marchers. She was uh, brutally beaten on Bloody Sunday, which was when uh, the National Guard, and not just that, anyone they could enlist, any uh, bold man, bold young boy from 18 and up, they enlisted as uh, they promoted to the rank of, you know, uh, a temporary, I forget the word used, it wasn't patrolman, but, you know, somebody to, to, um, to uh, you know, combat, contain the, the protesters, the marchers, right? So she was brutally beaten um, on, on, uh, uh, on Bloody Sunday. Then two weeks later, the march proceeds. They get, the MLK state gets police. the permit to march. Go ahead. It's the state police. The state police, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> And she tells her story about that experience. And that's gonna be the next couple of texts. But she started before that, she goes to when she was seven. And she talks about um, how, what, what segregation is, right? When, when, when you think uh, segregation in, in, in uh, black civil rights history, if you're like me, the first image that comes to mind is uh, you know, colored water fountain, whites only water fountain, or or bathrooms, or on, so on and so forth. And she says you have to understand that that's not that's not segregation. She says this is segregation, and and she tells this story. So does somebody want to read? You see that sign, whites only. It has it's that's where it's saying it's like cup. Yeah, and I thought it would be. Seven fifty-eight. Mm. I don't know. We were in Richmond at the airport. Mm. It was the first time. Fifty-seven, fifty-eight. The first time I saw it, and wow. Yeah. Sure. New Yorker. Right there, it is right. And we saw signs that said uh, "No blacks," but it didn't say blacks. No Jews. No dogs. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Who wants to to I read this? Read. Okay. Go ahead. Go for it, Bill. When did you learn? As long as I live, I will always believe that segregation was the cause of my mother's death. I know that God has a special day to take our loved ones, and as sure as you were born, you're going to die. However, I feel different about Mama's death. I was only seven years old when Mama died. I can still hear the word ringing in my ears that the grown-up said, should be alive today if she wasn't colored. When I was older, I learned that Mama died from complications during her pregnancy. My mama was pregnant and the baby she was carrying had died within her. The toxins from the baby's body had poisoned her system. I also found out that a transfusion would have saved her life. Burwell's infirmary was a colored hospital. It did not have the equipment to perform a blood transfusion, nor did they have the blood. She could have gotten a transfusion at the white hospital, but colored people were not allowed services at that hospital. The blood had to come from Birmingham, Alabama, and sent to Selma on a trailway bus. This would take several hours to reach us. By the time the blood arrived at the bus station, it was too late. My daddy picked it up at the bus station and rushed 
to Burwell's. When daddy arrived with the blood, he was informed that her mom had just died 15 minutes ago. What did segregation do to me and my siblings? Segregation caused my sisters, Jackie and Joan, Joni? Joanne, yeah. Joanne, sorry. And my brother Al and I to grow up without our mama. I would often walk in on daddy sitting in a room by himself, talking to himself, saying 15 minutes. Yeah, it, it just brings you to tears. It, it is utterly heartbreaking. It's the depth of human cruelty. It's not different today. It's not different today. It, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think it's a little Right there, are, you hear heartbreaking stories of women who couldn't access the care they needed and so they bleed out and die, right? So there are resonances, right? Segregation has legally ended, right? So it, it may not, right? We That era of, you know, but, but there was something that um, Brian Stevenson says in a TED talk that we listened to that slavery didn't end, it evolved. Slavery didn't end, it evolved, right? Slavery became Jim Crow, became mass incarceration, right? It, there are still, it, it just evolved. So while you might technically be correct to say that segregation ended, what are you talking about? Slaves were freed, right? Equal, the Voting Rights Act, which was a large result of this march that she went on, right? But mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a very real point that this still exists. And when we had the rekindle panel here at our um, anti-Semitism Shabbaton, over and over again, participants on the panel, black participants said, Cleveland's a very segregated city. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I've just threw you into the pit of despair. Um, and now I, I I can't promise to take you out of it completely, but, but just like hate disrupts the natural order, I want us to now read another text from the same woman, from Linda, about how love disrupts the natural order. So does somebody else. Okay, Francis, thank you. Turning 15 on the road to freedom. And by the way, I want you to think like and read like midrashists. If you're doing this, finding a similar verse or a similar word or a similar something between two texts as examples for love and for hate, keep that hat on as you're reading this. Okay, go ahead. Turning 15 on the road to freedom. Linda Blackman Laurie. It was March 22nd, 1965, my 15th birthday. When I left the tent, I walked out into a foggy, dreary morning. In front of me, I saw three white National Guardsmen. By the way, this is on the march, two weeks after Bloody Sunday. Okay, go ahead. The march <clears throat> from Selma to Montgomery, to be clear, yes. voting rights. Yes. Now there were maybe a hundred guardsmen around, but I just focused on the, those three because they were looking right at me and the long steel bayonets of their rifles were pointed at me. In my eyes, they looked exactly like the white troopers who had beaten me on bloody Sunday. I started screaming and I couldn't stop. I was scared they were there to kill me, to finish the job they started two weeks before. The ladies tried to comfort me, to ease my fear. They talked about the significance of what we were doing and how far we'd come in this struggle, but I could not be comforted. Then a white man named Jim Lesser came over to me. He'd lost a leg in a war and was walking all the way to Montgomery on two crutches. Jim told me that before he'd let anyone else harm another hair on my head, he would lie down and die for me. I knew I couldn't let this man do more for me than I could do for myself. My grandmother used to say that if you give in to something, if you give someone or something control over you, then you've given up on yourself. And you couldn't do that. So I couldn't let George Wallace or my fear from having been beaten take control of me. Jim Leather and I marched and talked and sang freedom, freedom songs together down that highway. <laughs> right, so there, there's a couple things. Um, one, I just love the way she puts it as, as the slavery that she's breaking free from is both the literal uh, racism and, and segregation, but also the freedom from fear. Right, this this fear in her own mind from the PTSD she experienced that she was she is breaking free from um, by because it, in actuality those those troopers were not pointing their bayonets at her, right? But it was how she experienced them because of what had just happened. Um, also, just 
in terms of context, this is uh, several weeks later at, at a point in time where the National Guard are there to protect the 300 marchers because they only allowed 300 marchers and Linda was the youngest one uh, on this road from Route 80 from Selma to Montgomery. So on Bloody Sunday, the state uh, police are there to put down the marchers, tell them they have to go back to their homes, that they won't get across the bridge without being in trouble. By this time, because there is a permit and we already have uh, the federal government intervening with Alabama to protect the marchers, it's a different situation. But Linda doesn't appreciate that at first because of her prior experience. Right. And uh, so if you're, and, and, and of course, what's so salient to me, and I think what hit all of us is, it's like, oh, thank God, right? People can still be people, right? People can still be wonderful and glorious. And not only a white man, right? A, a veteran who served his country, who got a leg blown off in a war, does this 54 mile march in crutches and is the only one who's finally able to comfort this little girl and say that I won't let anyone hurt another hair on your head. I will lay down my life for you, right? So again, if you, it, it's that DNA, the, the ship with the a thousand tax thing, right? It's, it's not just this, unfortunately, it's not just this either, right? It's this, it's this somewhere in the middle, go ahead. You asked us to find things that this reminds us of. So they're marching and singing. Mm -hmm. And there are times in the Bible where people are marching and singing. I think mean, of King David as he mm -hmm. enters into Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, music and singing, uh, a sign of freedom too. So there are examples that we can say that relate in some way to what they uh, an encounter. So this is the perfect segue. and and and. But before we even go there, I'm going to say that the the um, midrash, if you were reading as first, I'll say this. Hold on, I'm going to I'm going to pause the segue for one second and say, did anybody reading as a midrashist find the common link between the two stories that would be the verse you put to say here's hate in one way and love in another? Go ahead. Uh, I kind of found a parallel between the father's actions in <laughs> one and Jim's actions in the other. Uh, Father was working as best he could within his system mm -hmm. to save the life. Wow, great. Uh, even though he failed, and we see the, the, the failure, what an impact it had on him. Mm -hmm. Whereas Jim also is saying, I'm going to work the hardest I can to save a life. That's great. And in this case, we, we feel it was successful. So we went from well, same efforts, uh, unfortunately, given one system, couldn't do it, and the other was able to. Beautiful. Not the one I had in mind. Yeah. A I, great I, one. Go ahead. Going, the thing that I noticed was the 15 minutes versus 15 years. That yeah. was the one I got. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the Go ahead, you want to say again? <laughs> 15 and one word. Yeah, 15 minutes versus 15 years. Uh, it also yeah. mentions in both, speaking of ancestors in the mind, she mentions her father, she mentions her siblings, mm. she mentions her grandmother. Mm. Uh, so I see a tie here. Yeah. Uh, family uh, influences were very strong. Great, another great one. Another great one. I mean, this this has nothing to do with what was in the first one, but the, this line about I could, but I could not be comforted mm. reminded mm. me of um, was Jacob, wasn't it? Couldn't be comforted or Rachel and, and also yes, and Rachel, also, uh, and uh, and yeah. also Dave. Ramah buried uh, by Bethlehem. Ramah that my, crying for right. children. Okay, that's what it cannot was. be comforted. Yeah. I knew. Good. Same story, different. Right. different. Right. different. Yeah. Um, but also yeah, yeah, yeah. David, who couldn't be comforted, he couldn't get warm. So this goes back to the segue. But but one point, yeah, that's right. David and end of age, they, uh, end of his life as an old king, they bring um, sh uh, uh, the Shulamite. Shulamite, um, Abishag. Abishag, the Shulamitess. Thank you. Uh, she would know to comfort, to be a comfort to him. And interestingly enough, not sexually, they, but but as a yeah, so it was to know. keep him warm. But they never actually um, shared a bed, right? But. Um, but but this 15 was what stuck out to me, and I know it was the obvious one, but still I think there's something painfully beautiful about it, that 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and then the day she turns 15, there is this, this wonderful example of, of humanity makes the, the horror. She realized it. I, yeah, I don't know, actually. I don't know. 
I, I, if I had thought of it at the time, I would have asked her, but, but I wonder. Um, okay, now here's the segue that Jerry set up and that, that, that Ron set up, which is um, it, right now the, the Jewish-Black relationship is fraught because of, of responses to Israel, right? And it, it's really difficult. It's something that's, that's really complicated and hard. And uh, what, but what's, what was so screamingly apparent through this trip were the resonances between our stories. Right? Not to say that they're the same, they're different stories, but there are so many resonances. And it made me think of a Havdalah candle, right? that the braided candles, that they're different, but they are intertwined inextricably. And it feels like the light has gone out on that candle. And I think maybe that's why they call it rekindle. You know, I, they call it that because they want to rekindle the relationship. This was the group um, of Jew, Jewish people and black people who, who um, learn from each other and uh, it's great. Actually, they're open. The applications are open for the next cohort if you're interested. But and they came for the our anti-Semitism weekend. But Shabbaton. But anyway, I, I I think of how do we rekindle this relationship that is that is fraught, and I think it begins with hearing each other, listening to each other's stories, and recognizing the resonances and the similarities, um, and also appreciating the differences. Um, but so what follows from here for the next 10 minutes, and by the way, I do have a slideshow presentation that I'll just, I'll get to at the very end just to show you some pictures to put some faces to the, to the names of the experience we had. But here are some of the Jewish texts that jumped out at me throughout the trip. Um, so first is from Likute Maharan. Um, this is uh, uh, from a very famous uh, rabbi in our tradition. Um, I'm blanking on it, but he he had depression. He was he's Rebbe Nachman, Rebbe Nachman of Bratislav. Uh, that's what the Likutei Maharan is. And there's a song that comes from this, which we can sing together if you know it. But does anybody want to read this first text? And when you do, what what is the resonance that comes to you with the civil rights movement? And a story we just told about the march is your clue. But who wants to who wants to share? Who wants to read? I think the common word here. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah. And no. A person must cross a very, very narrow bridge, main roads, and not be frightened at all. Right, and that it makes me think of Linda's fear, and she had to talk herself out of that fear. And um, so the 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 song, and feel free to sing it if you if you know it. But Kol Aulam Kulo Geshem Sarda Geshem Sarda Geshem Sarda. Oh, all of the world is a very narrow bread, and the principal rule is not to be afraid at all. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in. My voice is bad, so I appreciate it. You could cover it up. Your ear must be bad, too. <laughs> Wait, I wanted to show you as we were doing that um, a photo, but I want to share it with the group as well on Zoom. Yeah, how could you not be frightened at all? He also said that you, it's a great mitzvah to be happy always. And he suffered from depression. So I wonder what he means when he talks in these extremes. Well, he's the one he ended up going on. He's the one who worked out on the forest and yelling, screaming, right? Forgive his life. Oh, it's, it's totally possible. Yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can get this up real quick for the Zoomers as well. Right. We uh, right. Fear, fight, or flight. They serve purposes to get us to act. Right. Um, okay. Let me see if I can just show you a couple. So first, uh, this. Is, wait. I wanted to start at the beginning. Oh. Okay. Here. Let's just do some of this, and then with the time we have left, we'll go back to the text if we have time. Uh, file. How do I present? Edit. View. Is it a view thing? No. Tools. Slide. There is log. No. I really should know how to do these things. Okay, file. Okay, here we go. So this was one, um, and this made me think of the midrash. Uh, uh, love and hate disrupt the natural order. These two arches in the uh, um, 
seal of Montgomery, which our tour guide pointed out, Scott. One, birthplace of the civil rights movement. The other, cradle of the Confederacy. Right, how these two truths can be uh, true at the same time. And be in a seal, right? The cradle of the Confederacy because it was the first capital of the Confederacy before they moved the capital to Richmond. Right. right. <laughs> but isn't it great to hold both identities? And I feel yeah. like as human beings, we yeah. hold both the worst of us and the best of us. Go ahead, Helena. Why is this time again the best? I know, I know. I, I know. I, it's, I, I can't not see that, right? I, I, I'm 99% sure that it is not intended to be a McKenna <laughs> I think it's just like you have a sheriff oh, sure. star badge kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Um, This is uh, Linda Blackman uh, and her sister, Joanne. Which is which? Linda's uh, on the right, Joanne's on the left. Right, so Linda's the older sister. She's the one in the white shirt. Um, and she was so lovely and wonderful and uh, she actually asked, so unfortunately, after everything Diffon has been through, she's now suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. And she asked uh, the rabbis to offer her a Misha Beira. Mm -hmm. So this next one is, hold on, where is it? Yeah, we were offering her a Misha Beira there. And you could see how respectful she was and, and wanting this uh, Jewish Misha Beira. And that's Rabbi Melinda Mersak here. And you can you might recognize some faces in our in our group here. <laughs> About the mask one. Uh, <laughs> She's from the West Side Temple. She uh, it actually J Hub. If you know the organization J Hub, and if you Mark, yeah, she's a member. If you know Mark, she probably does uh, programs with them, partners with them. But she's she runs J Hub, and her husband Mark Jacobs is an officer here and our so president of uh, Treasurer. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this was um, this is. Uh, uh, Jim Leatherer. Oh. That's who walked the march, the 54 miles. And that's that's John. I, uh, I thought it was John Lewis here. Yes. Participate a lot in civil war. It is. He was later. Um, this is the very narrow bridge. This is uh, the, the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I love, here's uh, Rabbi Mersak wearing. Yes. Right? I have to add about this bridge. You know, it's named for Edmund Pettus, and the name can't be changed because Alabama passed a law that anything that, that was named 50 years ago or more, the name has to be preserved. But Edmund Pettus, among other things, was a Confederate officer, a Confederate senator, a U.S. senator, uh, and a Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this we, we had the privilege of meeting with a 91 year old Bishop Calvin Woods, who uh, you know, yeah, oh, okay, right. yeah. exactly. So he, he actually he would do the shouting, and uh, our, our tour guide said it, it's very most likely he has Tourette's, and that's what's doing it. Oh. But for him, he says it's it's when he feels the Holy Spirit. Oh, good, uh, yeah, so it's, it's pretty, <laughs> let's see if it's. Interesting. Let me see. I don't know if the volume. Oh, see if you recognize the song he's singing. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> what song? What song? Where does that come from in our? From Hallel. This is the day the Lord has made. Yeah. And again, it's that Shikachaloba Olamo, right? How do you do it? How do you have this existence that that humanity can be beautiful and wonderful and life can be beautiful and wonderful? And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He's meeting with a group of 32. Uh, Jews who decided to go on this trip and, and we started his session with us. Um, mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Hold on. This is us with him. He's there in the center. You can see him, but. Who is the centerpiece? Uh, this is, um, yeah, he's the centerpiece. Right? Uh, this was in the, the museum uh, that we went into following this. Um, this was uh, a note at a Jewish department store that employed uh, a Black workers in a time when you know they were not employed. Sorry, I don't trade with Jews or N word. Uh, Pitsitz, which is the name of the Jewish store, is a Jew 
is a Jew, saying that the owner is a Jew, and he, and he employs two, notice two is misspelled. Yes. <laughs> too many stinking, ignorant, repulsive, N-word. Thanks for nothing, a US citizen. Uh, okay, now this, this is a, a, a difficult takeaway, but it was such an important one of our trip that our Jewish tour guide really wanted to make sure that we understood, which is this is the icon one of the many iconic photos of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was a personal friend of Martin Luther King's, who came down to march with him. And there they are, hand in hand, marching together. <clears throat> what I never noticed in a million years and could never have told you is that looming in the background in the tallest building building in, uh, this is Selma or Montgomery? Selma. No, in Selma. This is oh. right in front of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They're about to enter the bridge. Is uh, You see it says Teppers. Yeah. yeah. Tepper's, it was a Jewish owned, uh, it was, what was it, retail? Yeah, it was a department store department in store. Selma, and you could tell us about Tepper. Yeah, he was a horrible racist, and he created a story that ultimately uh, stuck to acquit um, people who had lynched uh, a Black person, um, and he got them off with this story he created. But so so you have, in the same photo, again, Ahava Mekakel Rashura, Vesina Mekakel Rashura, Abraham Joshua Heschel are, are, are Jews proudly marching with MLK and looming in the background is a Jew who very much didn't. And, and the difficult point that he really wanted to communicate to us is that we should take pride in our involvement in civil rights, but we cannot inflate it. We have to recognize that Jews were on both sides of this thing. Um, I've seen that picture often. No. Did they explain yeah. the delays? Yes, there was a Hawaiian uh, minister that came and was handing them out. And uh, MLK, uh, sorry, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, Rabbi Heschel, gave his lay to Joanne Blackman, the other sister, and she said, thank you, Santa Claus. Because a little kid, she thought this rabbi with a big long beard giving her present must have been Santa Claus. Uh, where? Great question. Um, David or Debbie, do you know who's between Heschel and MLK here? Uh, somebody asked that at the time. Was it the Unitarian minister? It might be. It was another minister yeah. whose name I can't remember, but might be recognizable. So I'm sorry, I can't remember. Just say the museum. It's like the um, Freedom something memorial. Uh, go ahead. Do you remember? No, I remember that they built that. They, yeah, and 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 I came from. I was in Germany with the bridge uh, this past summer, and we went to the Holocaust memorials, and they're very similar in terms of how the architecture gets you to think and feel. And for instance, and there, there were these slabs for each of the um, to to commemorate those who were murdered in the Shoah. And that it was the architecture was such that you were standing on cobblestone that was designed to get you to be unsteady. And the point there was to get you to feel like Jews living in Germany, where the ground was always unsteady. Right? You might be succeeding in one moment, but anything could change on a dime. Yes, very difficult. And also, it becomes it narrows in. There, inside the hallways are designed to narrow in to show you that constricting feeling of the walls closing in. And so this was similar where it's designed to get you to offer your neck. These are the victims of lynchings. Mm -hmm. And you can see here is Barbara offering her neck to look up to see. Uh, uh, and you imagine these as human beings hanging from trees, right? There's no names or anything. There are, there are. Yeah. Um, this is the, uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> the Dover family and this is at MLK and Coretta Scott King's uh, burial, their tomb here. And the water is a very important image I told you we'd come back yeah. to. Um, I'm waiting. Yeah, <laughs> let's just, we're gonna end because I know we're a couple minutes over and I apologize, but let's go yeah. back to our source sheet really quickly for just a final wrap up. I mean, that's it, that's reference to the water, done? <laughs> that's it? No, no, you have a source sheet. You have, a source oh, sheet. You have an entry in the source sheet. Oh, good. Uh, so the question of what do you hear with our ancestors calling to us, what are they saying? And uh, let me get this back up. Okay. Um, and one of the museums, by the way, they took the dirt by every tree where they could find, where they knew that uh, a black person had been lynched and they took the dirt and they put it in a container uh, uh, like it's 
sacred ground. It's what's left of them. And they put it on this giant shelf with just uh, container after container of the dirt. But it made me think of... With the name of the victim. With the name of the victim. And it made me think of when Cain kills Abel, Genesis 4.10. What have you done? Hark your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Yep. So the question that I what we started with that I want to end with is the voice of our ancestors like the Stumpelsteiners in Germany where on the ground is a tile of the name of a Jewish person who was uh, either killed or sent to a concentration camp or, or removed from their dwelling right? That there is a voice calling out to us from the ground. What is that voice telling us in this moment? Um, and, and Reverend Bishop Calvin Woods, who is with us, the man you saw uh, singing in the video, that uh, the blood of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King calls out to us from the ground, and it calls for freedom, justice, and equality. He said that without any of this prompting. Like, there, there was no, I didn't talk to him about Cain and how I was thinking about that text. He just offered that in his own you know, un unprompted. Um, so in Judaism, the only separation that we believe in is Hamavdil ben Kodesh Lechol, which is that prayer we say over that braided Havdalah candle, right? We don't separate between people who are all Hadosh, are all holy. We separate between profane, justice and injustice, right? Love and hate, and each having the power to disrupt the natural order. Um, so let's end with Words made famous by MLK, but initially from our prophet Amos. Bill, I'll ask you to read. But let justice. Yes, I, I would. But let justice well up like water, righteousness like an yeah. unfailing stream. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. There, there is more to these sheets. So if you have these sheets, um, what you'll find in your own time, if you'd like, on page four at the very end, an excerpt from Rabbi Joachim Prince's speech. This was the rabbi that preceded MLK for his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, um, one big one, uh, quote I wanted to bring is, America must not become a nation of onlookers. America must not be silent. No. And he says that that's what his people learned in Germany during the Shoah. Uh, and finally, if you read Dr. Susanna Heschel, the Heschel's daughter, um, she writes about the challenge of the Selma photograph. This is an excerpt from that piece where she's talking about her father, Heschel, in the forefront and Tepper's in the background. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So,